Good morning and welcome to the Korea Society and welcome to Studio Korea. We're delighted to have you here in the studio audience today and we'd like to welcome all of our online viewers. We know we have viewers today in Washington, Seoul and elsewhere, so welcome to them. I would like to welcome our distinguished guests who are here today to discuss the complexities, the opportunities, the challenges of relations among Korea, China and the United States. And I will begin here directly to my left uh, with Professor Shendong Lee, who is uh, Associate Dean uh, from Fudan University in Shanghai, China, who has flown in for this. Thank you very much, Deng Lee. Scott Snyder, our good friend from the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Professor uh, Sung Yun Lee, who is here from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Uh, Ralph Kossa, the president of the Pacific Forum, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, in Honolulu and who who is actually flown in from Burma for this. Thank you, Ralph. John Delory, who is a professor at Yonsei University and author of Wealth and Power, uh, which was mentioned here at the Korea Society and around town earlier this year, a very excellent publication indeed. And I'd like to welcome uh, Han Suk Kee, who is here from Yonsei University and as we will get to shortly, played a role in terms of advising President Park Geun-hye and was with the group that visited Beijing this summer. Uh, I also wanted to take a few moments by way of introduction and recognize a few people in our studio audience who have played a very key role in getting us all here today. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our friends from the National Committee on American Foreign Policy who have joined us. Uh, they are led by Don Zagoria here in the front row and we are delighted uh, that Don and his team have been kind enough to extend an invitation to their group. I'd also like to thank our friends from the Council at Mission and to recognize Carter Booth, one of our board members here at the Korea Society. A special thanks as well to the Korea Society staff, many of whom have uh, put in very extensive efforts in recent days to see this morning come to fruition. I would also like to say by way of introduction that this morning is something of a tribute uh, by way of recognition of uh, the memory of Professor Robert Scalapino. This is the first of what we hope will be a regular uh, occasional series of discussions of regional relations named in honor of Bob. Uh, all of those here at the table knew Professor Scalapino very well. We would like to thank uh, Rochelle Halperin at the University of California, Berkeley, as well as Lynn Scalapino and the entire family for extending Bob's name for us to this. Uh, he was certainly an intellectual force. Uh, he was a very uh, dramatic mind and a very passionate force for Northeast Asia and the improvement of relations. And we're delighted to be able to recognize him in even the small way through this morning's conversation. We'd also like to begin uh, with sort of full knowledge of the fact that we're on the top of a very busy media cycle. Uh, many of the individuals here you may have seen quoted just in the last few hours in major publications and uh, in electronic media in terms of the uh, reported execution of Jang Sung Tech in North Korea, uh, the consolidation of power by Kim Jong-un or perhaps a power struggle involving Kim Jong-un. And we would like to take about 15 minutes at the beginning here before we launch into the discussion more fully on the trilateral relation dynamic to discuss really the top of the news today and to get a reaction in terms of the execution of Jiang Sing Tech as it's reported and what may or may not be happening in Pyongyang. And uh, perhaps I could actually begin at the opposite side and, and ask Han Suk Kee to begin and we'll just go around and ask if you've any thoughts about uh, what's happening in Pyongyang now and what would inform our audience here in New York and online. Um. Maybe I don't have any, any enough in, information about the execution of Chang Song Tech, but from my observation, I think um, I can find um, three implications of the execution of Chang Song Tech. The first one is uh, still North Korean politics is still remained in 1950s and 1960s of uh, confrontations. So uh, if uh, the major leader, he uh, if you know to enforce by his own power, he has to to use some uh, violence against his uh, opponents. Second thing is uncertainty of the future of North Korean politics would be very increased. Uh, so currently, uh, many people say that why uh, Kim Jong-un, he, he just initiated that ex execution because of his lack of his power or the strength of his power. A lot of uh, rumors there, but I think um, this kind of uh, scenario uh, gives us some uh, implication that the uncertainty of the future of North Korean politics would be much more growing. 
Uh, third one is um, um, the North Korea and China relationship is very uncertain. Uh, currently, I think um, uh, China wants to have a more influence over North Korea, but the, this, uh, this instance showed us that uh, China's influence over North Korea is very limited. So uh, the future of North Korea-China relationship would be very uncertain. So uh, I just uh, summarized that with three, these three factors. Thank you, Professor Han. Professor Delory. Yeah, um, <clears throat> there's so many different directions we can take the Jiang Song Tech discussion in, but um, you know the, the sorts of things that I'm thinking about. Um, I, I, first of all, I'm trying to rather than as someone who didn't anticipate this, you know, some people did, but I was not of that group. Um, it's a good chance to really question your assumptions um, and think about what are the questions. Uh, like like uh, Saki is saying, there's so many question marks still. So I think sharpening the questions we ask and the things we're looking at, uh, looking for uh, in the future is important. But one question I'm asking is, why did North Korea make the decision to give so much detail um, about this, to make it so public? Um, I think most of us would agree that's unprecedented, certainly in recent memory. It's a kind of airing of dirty laundry. And it's someone who... Uh, it's not solely Jiang Song Tech. There's, it's explicit that there's a faction. They're, they're naming more and more names, plus the reports we're getting of other people are having trouble. So this is not just one bad apple. This is a whole group at the very highest levels of their system. And this is a system that, you know, from the outside world, we see it as, uh, for the most part, as uh, sometimes we, we describe it as an evil system itself, a regime, but from within the regime. Uh, it's incredibly, it's, it's the exact mirror opposite. Uh, they pride themselves on their unity, on their virtue, um, and yet here they're, they're so in such detail admitting the level of corruption and vice and division um, that this is really, you know, my background is in China, modern China, like, like Saki, and, you know, I'm thinking about it in terms of many of us who watch China are thinking about it in terms of Bo Xilai and the trial of Bo Xilai, but it also sort of goes back to Lin Biao, you know, in the height of the Cultural Revolution, where uh, the person who was leading the cult of Mao suddenly turned into the enemy of the, the revolution. And we know in retrospect that that was a, a whiplash moment for the Chinese people because they were being prodded on to believe in all these things and suddenly the leader of that movement um, turned out to be a, a counter-revolutionary. So, um, so those are some of the things. The other quickly questions I'm asking is, um, you know, what is the fallout with China? Um, as Saki is saying, I mean, and I'd love to hear Shen Ding Li and others who spend time in China uh, get into this. You know, in my experience, talking with Korea experts in China, yes, Jiang Song Tech had a big part of that portfolio, but they didn't necessarily have this deep love for Jiang Song Tech. Um, and they're very pragmatic, too, especially when it comes to the economic side of the relationship, which he was key to. So for the time being, I don't see this as uh, a signal that there's going to be necessarily a very bad period between China and North Korea. It hasn't been a particularly good period. Uh, in the last year or two when Zhang has had a big part of that portfolio. So I think this is a real moment of truth for Kim Jong-un or whoever ordered this and whoever is really in charge. They have some major decisions to make about how they're going to handle the relationship with China going forward. Um, and similarly with economic reform, Zhang, you know, we often say Zhang equals China. Zhang equals economic reform. Therefore, if Zhang is down, it's anti-China and it's anti-economic reform. Um, I'm also not seeing it yet being framed by the North Koreans in terms of the target of this is economic reform. And just one point I would make um, to, to fill that out a little bit is there's, there have been these strange, you know, it just seems like these statements against Zhang have gone out of their way to say he tried to disrupt the authority of the cabinet. Um, and the cabinet has been given this lead position um, in economic reformist efforts such as they are. So now Zhang, I also you know, saw in this most recent statement, was blamed for the 2009 currency redenomination. You know, so rather than try and defend that choice, they're actually laying it on him. So whether it's true or not, so far I'm not seeing the linkages mm -hmm. um, to that broader point. But again, it's right now just raising uh, the deepest questions about what's going on in North Korea and how do we uh, evaluate it. Thank you, John DeLore. Ralph Cosler. Yeah, Steve, thank you. Uh, I mean, 
first and foremost, when it comes to North Korea, we're all guessing. Uh, what, what you have here are some very accomplished guessers, uh, but, but we're, all, uh, we're all guessing. And, and certainly, uh, this is a very confusing time, and we have to wait for a few more shoes to drop, a few more people to uh, be disposed in order to figure out. And clearly, I think more people will be disposed, as, as John says. The, the frustrating part from a person who's tried to figure out uh, what North Korea is up to is that every event has at least two equally plausible, diametrically opposed answers. Uh, you can see what's going on right now and conclude, as, as many seem to be concluding in the press, this shows Kim Jong-un is firmly in control. He's now got the power and he's, you know, even throw out his uncle. But you could make the equal case that this means that he's not in control at all, that the military is essentially calling the shots, they're keeping him there as a figurehead, and they're removing the, quote, civilian general who obviously they weren't real pleased with in the first place. What's the real answer? Who knows? Uh, you know, we're all sort of guessing, speculating, trying to watch and see. Uh, uh, as John says, and, and I, I, I tend to agree with, with him, but with a, probably a little bit more skepticism, uh, many people had been hoping for a regime change in, in North Korea. Uh, we may have just had it, uh, but not in the way we wanted. Uh, and, and this is, I think, a concern. I, I was sort of looking to Korea to hopefully someday follow the China model. And recall, we had regime change in China. One day, the Gang of Four were in charge. Mm -hmm. The next day, Deng Xiaoping came mm -hmm. back, the reformist. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people uh, were looking at John Sung Tech as the Deng Xiaoping of North Korea. This was the guy that was going to sort of mm. turn things around. I think China, in particular, was looking at him in that, in that regard. Mm -hmm. What I keep hearing from the Chinese up until the last few days uh, on North Korea is give them a chance. They're moving in the right direction. They're really serious about reform, et cetera, et cetera. I would imagine there are a lot of people in China right now doing a lot of serious reassessing and trying to figure out just what's, what's really going on. It could mean that any hope for reform in the near term is now gone. Uh, on the other hand, it could have just been a power struggle between a couple of people that had nothing to do with policy, it had all to do with power, uh, and John Sung Tech lost out. So we're going to have to see, you know, a little bit more happen before I think we can take a, a good guess. But I would really expect that the, the country that is most concerned right now is China, since it seemed to me at least that they had put a lot of eggs in the John Sung Tech basket, uh, and that basket is now overturned. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Professor Lee. Thank you, Dr. Norper. <clears throat> I think this event, the humiliating uh, fall of Chang Sung Tech and the swift execution of this number two man in North Korea may come to be viewed years from now as a harbinger of the decline and gradual fall of the DPRK, but not in a conventional way, that is. Uh, in the 18th century, Edward Gibbon, upon the completion of his magisterial, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, intoned thus, I will not dissemble the first emotion of joy, and perhaps the, establish the establishment of my fame uh, upon the recovery of my freedom. But my pride was soon humbled, and a sober melancholy was cast over my mind at the thought that I had taken an everlasting leave of an old and agreeable companion, and whatever the future date of my history, the life of the historian must be short and precarious. To steal a line from that lengthy passage, in a totalitarian system, oftentimes we've seen that the life of the number two man is short and precarious. Sixty years ago, Stalin died on March 5th. At the time, a man named Beria was widely considered to be the most powerful man living at the time. Well, three months later, he joined Stalin. And as Professor Deluri mentioned, Lin Biao as well. In China, we see purges of the number two man, while the number one man, the man on top, is still uh, in power. So Chang Song Tech's case should not be viewed as that unconventional. It should not come as a surprise, because his utility as the guardian or regent was to expire. What may be surprising to some is that it came so soon, just two years into Kim Jong-un's rule. 
Now we can extrapolate from this, as Mr. Costa said, uh, two <coughs> opposing views. Whether this is an indication of the fact that Kim Jong-un is firmly in charge, or whether this indicates that there's some regime instability situation brewing remains to be seen. My speculation is that this is the former, that is. It shows that Kim Jong-un is bold enough, comfortable enough, to do something drastic like this. And in that context, I think it makes sense that Kim Jong-un would have carried out the execution of his uncle soon after the indictment, soon after the arrest. There are, of course, at least two objectives, purposes to a purge. The first, obviously, is to remove that potential rival from power. The secondary objective is, the second objective is to have a demonstrative effect, to make a case, to show you, to deter all who would harbor illusions about building power, a power base, or perhaps one day becoming a contender for the throne, it's to instill fear in those people. And this dramatic execution achieves just that. So in the short term, I don't see another number two man arising within the North Korean political system. Uh, in the long term, however, I see Kim Jong-un, it's hard for me to imagine Kim Jong-un having a long and healthy life. He could conceivably be in power for the next 50 years. He's only about 30 years old. But it's hard for me to imagine Kim Jong-un upon voluntary retirement or due to infirmed health and so forth 50 years from now, joining his grandfather and father in the Kumsu Mausoleum, the world's most extravagant mausoleum. Because of the growing disparity in income by all indices of measuring state power, economic power, soft power, population, territorial size, and so forth. South Korea is the preferred Korean state, the Korean state of choice for many North Koreans. And the disparity between the South and North is poised to grow with time. And that is an overwhelming existential challenge for the Kim dynasty. So I don't see Kim Jong-un being in power for the next 50 years, and I think the odds are that one day, yes, he will be deposed, but not in the foreseeable future. Scott Snyder? Well, um, I can uh, neither uh, refute or add to uh, anything that uh, uh, my uh, previous speakers uh, have already said, because as with many things in North Korea, there's an inverse relationship between speculation and the amount of facts that we have on which to speculate. Uh, what I would say that stands out to me is simply that um, this, I think, was uh, an expected next phase in the consolidation of Kim Jong-un's power, but I think that it was done in a manner that may well weaken the system uh, because, you know, this sort of public display of division uh, that goes up to the top, uh, the purges of side branches, and with Jang Song Tech, uh, a network that apparently had roots, uh, may have impact in terms of uh, the structure of the system that we haven't really anticipated yet. And then the second theme I just want to pick up that has already been discussed is, yes, Jiang Song Tech has widely been viewed as a reformer, but I thought it was very interesting um, in the KCNA statement that he was really presented as an obstacle to reform. That's intriguing. We'll have to wait and see what happens, but uh, I think that that is a space to watch. Thank you, Scott. Professor Shen Deng Wei. Uh, I have three points to make. Uh, first, this uh, uh, issue has come as a surprise to many, uh, Chinese being no exception. Uh, but we view this is uh, internal affairs. We view this is uh, internal affairs. Therefore, we are not going to give much uh, comments on it. Uh, I give my personal uh, mm -hmm. as uh, Ralph stated, sp speculative work. <coughs> Point two, uh, in my view, North Korea seem to be highly unstable. This incident could lead to greater stability, no challenge uh, for the foreseeable future uh, to Kim Jong-un, or oh, this uh, could indicate the start 
uh, more challenges. Because according to a statement of North Korean government, which justify why uh, Jiang Song Taik needs to be purged, one argument was uh, he was preparing for replace the current leadership, hoping that uh, on some occasion when situation would further deteriorate, <coughs> uh, he would uh, stage a coup. Number two per person is thinking about, uh, is expecting his country situation to continue to deteriorate. Number three, number four, number five, all could expect the same because this is reality. And none of them is satisfied with this kind of continuing uh, poverty, famine. Uh, and they want to change, working with the boss to improve, or work together to oppose to the boss. They are unsatisfactory with the status quo. They want to improve either through reform or through our self-reliance. So with the approach of uh, Johnson Taik, I think other people would still think about how to improve. And uh, they may not exclude the way <coughs> Johnson Taik has been employed to think about either to, go, to do it positively or to do, to do it negatively. For instance, when Mao Zedong has led China uh, to the extreme poverty, Deng Xiaoping has only one way to save China, that is to purge Mao Zedong's wife, uh, to redirect China through uh, such kind of a, a virtual coup. For goodness, and we did not blame Deng Xiaoping. So as a, I think it, Johnson Taik's wisdom may make sense that uh, they have to change for better. But before he attained his wisdom, he uh, has been purged. But I think others would have sim develop a similar wisdom to change through either legitimacy or uh, given the, uh, the condition available to whatever they can. Simply would not know who, when, under which particular circumstance. Third point is, China was uh, uh, indirectly uh, deluded uh, in their government statement why Jiang Song Taik needs to be purged. Because one of his, the charge against him was he sold national interest to foreign country by agreeing to lease a part of the land in Rosong, a special city, for 50 years to a foreign country. And we know that to which country. So either China was uh, 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 naively accepting uh, the selling of North Korean interest without the intention to hurt their country, or uh, China accepted the selling of interest in a shrewd uh, and, uh, uh, way to hurt them. Uh, in the former way, China has been too innocent and, uh, but China still uh, should be responsible. For the second way, China is a uh, 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 confident of Jiang Song Taik, should be condemned, and the, uh, the wrong way to attain their legitimate national interest has to be returned, and China should apologize. Neither way is a nice way to describe China-North Korea relationship. So my former ministry spokesperson yesterday, uh, actually a few hours ago, uh, delivered uh, remarks uh, saying China North Korea has developed a normal economic and trade relationship. Pay attention to the word normal, not abnormal. Neither China sells our, our interest to them, nor we accept their illegal, uh, unwarranted selling of their interest to us. It's a balanced exchange. Good for common interest of the two countries and the two people. This is our official uh, uh, software way to deny 
their uh, rampant, so indirect attack of China. Thank you very much. Dean Shen of Fudan University, thank you. Uh, this concludes the rapid reaction portion of this morning in terms of the response to the reported execution of Zhang Song Tech.